Peter Pan, the eternal youth, the boy who wouldn't grow up. Is he a tragedy, a tyrant, or a true innocent? In this video essay, I'm going to be exploring the three different options, and you guys can let me know what your decision is down in the comments below. Let's take a look at the evidence for Peter Pan as a tragic figure. Our first piece of evidence to suggest that Peter Pan may be a tragic figure is shown in how Wendy Darling and her mother, and even Wendy's daughter Jane a little bit, treat him. These three certainly see him as a tragic figure, and at times so do other people as well. It's easy then for the reader to slip into this method of thinking, but why do they believe it? Well, Wendy Darling believes that she is in the presence of a tragedy as soon as she learns in her nursery that Peter Pan has no mother. Mrs Darling also feels that the boy should come home with her. She's adopting all of the other lost boys and bringing Wendy, John and Michael back home, and therefore she feels that Peter should come with them. He would go to school, go to an office, grow up. She longs to take him into her arms, but Peter holds back and will never let her do this. Mrs Darling also sees the tragedy in Peter's sadness to leave Wendy and the lost boys. And because Mrs Darling notices this, she takes pity on the tragic figure and offers that Wendy Darling can return to the Neverland once a year with Peter to help him with spring cleaning. The author J.M. Barry also uses the word tragedy to describe a lot of events surrounding the Eternal Boy as well. When Wendy Darling is crying, seeing how the pirates have kidnapped Tiger Lily and are planning to leave her on Maruna's Rock to drown, she is crying at the tragedy of the situation. And in this moment, J.M. Barry describes that Peter Pan has experienced many tragedies, often. However, he has, of course, forgotten them. And then, in the final chapter of the novel, and final act of the play, When Wendy Grew Up, an afterthought, J.M. Barry describes Wendy Darling as a grown-up woman with her own daughter Jane and then describes how one night there came the tragedy. This tragedy in question is the reappearance of Peter Pan himself. Returning back to the play then, which is my favorite form of Peter Pan media, at the moment when Peter tells Wendy Darling in her nursery that he doesn't have a mother, Wendy immediately leaps out of bed and rushes to try to throw her arms around him. However, Peter recoils back and tells Wendy, you mustn't touch me. Now there is an addition here, it wasn't in the original play, but I'm very glad that it was put in later. Jay and Barry added Peter's next line and the accompanying stage directions, supposedly for the actor Jean Forbes Robertson, who was described as the most eerie and unearthly of all the Peters. So Wendy has said, but your mother gets letters. And Peter says, don't have a mother. Wendy cries, Peter. She leaps out of bed to put her arms around him, but he draws back. He does not know why, but he knows he must draw back. Peter then says, the line that was added for Jean Forbes Robertson, you mustn't touch me. Wendy asks why. Peter says, no one must ever touch me. Wendy says, why again? And Peter says, I don't know. And the stage direction says, he is never touched by anyone in the play. Imagine a completely eerie, unearthly Peter who is detached from the human world and other people. The tragic boy never touched by anyone in the entire show whether they're friend or enemy. It really encompasses this idea that Peter is a tragic lone figure by himself and completely separated. The veil between the Neverland and the real world is real for Peter as well. There is a huge thing that plays into Peter being seen as a tragedy by both the characters within the story and the people reading it. And that is his history with his own family. Peter Pan ran away from home and went to live in Kensington Gardens. He became a betwixt and between, no longer human and not quite bird, but he did keep returning to his family's window and occasionally he would look at his sleeping mother, but he never chose to wake her. One day he thought maybe he would go back and decide to be her son. It's debatable whether he actually would have done because so far every time he went back, he never did and always returned to Kensington Gardens. However, this time he thought again, maybe he would. But the last time he went, the window was shut and barred, and he saw his mother asleep in his bed with another little boy in his place. While we can understand the family's decision to have another child and try and move on with their lives after this loss of Peter, you still have to see from the eternal boy's point of view, returning back to some place he believed would always be open and safe for him, only to find it shut in his face and there is no way back, whether he wants it or not. And that key part of his history plays into another fact about Peter that can be seen in a very tragic way. 
Peter does not like or trust grown-ups, and it's not hard to see the true tragedy of this belief. All Peter's experiences, though he forgets them, the feelings still remain with him. Every experience he has had with a grown-up, at least from Peter's side of things, has been negative. Starting with his own mother, who, to Peter's eyes, barred him out and no longer wanted him, went so far as to replace him with another little boy. When he got to the Neverland, he was fighting grown-ups who were his enemies. And, of course, don't forget about the Lost Boys. The Lost Boys are only on the Neverland because their own grown-ups, their own families, lost them and didn't come to reclaim them, and so they were sent away to the Neverland. And then Peter meets characters like Mrs. Darling, who entreat him to come back, and so it's no wonder that in his head he has built up grown-ups to be liars, betrayers, and murderers. I think all of that plays quite nicely into my next point for Peter as a tragedy, which is about Peter's dreams. Now, I've done an entire video about Peter Pan's nightmares, there'll be a link up here and I'll try to chuck it down below as well. So I'll only talk about it briefly right now, but the nightmares themselves definitely play into why characters like Wendy see Peter as a tragedy, and those people who have read the source material see it as well. In the play, J.M. Barry describes Peter's dreams as chasing the one boy who was never here nor anywhere, the one boy who could beat him. In the novel, he goes into this in a little bit more detail, saying that Peter Pan rarely has dreams, but when he does, they are more painful than those of other children. For hours, Peter cannot be separated from them, and he wails piteously in his sleep. Sometimes, Wendy will take him into her arms and comfort him through these nightmares, but she always makes sure to put him back in bed so he will never know and be embarrassed about what she did. And that definitely leads her to believe he is even more tragic in her eyes as well. And you can understand why, as a reader of this story, you'd think so too. Another huge point for seeing Peter Pan as a tragic figure lies in how Peter will forget everyone and everything. There are silly things in this. For example, in the nursery scene where Peter is trying to stick his shadow on with soap and then Wendy Darling offers to sew it on. When he cannot stick the shadow on with soap, he starts to cry and it's his crying that wakes up Wendy Darling. However, when she says that she can sew it on for him later, and it may hurt a little, Peter has already forgotten that he was crying earlier, and proclaims that he never cries. On the flight to the Neverland itself, Peter is all over the place, scattered. He keeps going off to have other adventures and returning back to the Darlings, sometimes forgetting what he has been doing, where he has been, and occasionally forgetting the Darlings themselves as well. He also forgets every time he has experienced an unfairness. And this is really seen in the moment on Maruna's Rock, when Peter has freed Tiger Lily and the pirates are now fighting with the Lost Boys. Peter gets onto Maruna's Rock to catch a breath as they're all fighting in the lagoon water. And then he realises that Captain Hook is climbing up the rock as well. And while he snatches his knife and gets ready to fight the man, Peter realises that Captain Hook is not as high up on the rock, and therefore it wouldn't be fighting fair. Depending on whether it's the play or the novel, Peter either waits for Captain Hook, or offers the pirate a hand. The outcome is the same either way though. Captain Hook claws at him twice with his iron hook. And this, to Peter, is his first time experiencing someone being unfair to him. And his reaction is absolutely tragic. He is left horrified and shocked. It's the unfairness that hurts him more than the pain itself. And then of course, a little later on in that particular moment, Peter Pan is standing on Maruna's rock completely alone, believing he's about to die. And again, he has forgotten every other time he has brushed with death. And so he's looking at this as if it's the first time, the first time he's been afraid of death. A tremor runs through him, just the once, J.M. Barry writes, but still, he's not like other boys, but he is afraid now, and he has to stand on a rock in the dark, completely by himself, and face death for what he believes is the first time. That, while brave, is also terribly tragic. And my final point then, arguing for Peter Pan as a tragedy. This comes in the penultimate chapter of the novel, and right near the end of the stage play. Wendy, John and Michael have flown back into their nursery and reunited with their parents. Mr and Mrs Darling and Nana and the children are all together, reunited, happy, ecstatic, so delighted, many happy tears are shed, it's a wonderful, beautiful scene. But, as J.M. Barry writes, there was no one to see it, except for the boy who was looking in through the window. J.M. Barry writes that Peter Pan has innumerable ecstasies that other children will never ever know, but, in this instance, 
he is looking through the window at the one joy he must be forever barred out of. It's easy to understand then why a lot of people see Peter Pan as a tragic figure. So let's change the game up completely then and talk about Peter Pan as a tyrant. The first argument I want to make involves Peter's smile. And it's something that I flatter myself by saying I don't think many other people know about, unless you are a Peter Pan hobbyist and obsessionist like I am and have read the source material as many times. Let me explain Peter Pan's smile. At one point in the story, J.M. Barry describes that Peter Pan has a smile playing about his face and Wendy saw it and shuddered. When that smile was on his face, no one dared address him. This comes at a moment when Peter is sniffing out danger and knows the pirates are near. We see it referenced later on Maruna's Rock. When Peter is standing, ready to face death, he has that smile on his face again. We see that smile referenced again in the final battle between Peter Pan and Captain Hook on the Jolly Roger. The two enemies looked at one another, Hook shuddering slightly, and Peter with the strange smile upon his face. That smile he wears when death might be near. Sticking with a very similar theme, Peter is described as having a greedy look in his eyes, which ought to have alarmed Wendy Darling. He is also described as frightfully cunning. And when Wendy Darling is wrestling with herself about whether or not to come to the Neverland at all, trying to think of the feelings of her parents, Peter Pan is described as having no pity for her. I've already mentioned the flight to the Neverland with Peter and the Darling children, and I want to bring it up again now because, well, there is quite a lot within that chapter that could lead you to believe that Peter Pan is a tyrant. Whenever the Darling children grew tired and started to fall asleep, they would drop out of the air like a stone. Peter Pan would laugh at this, and while Wendy would cry, save him, save him, when it was Michael or John, Peter would then dive down and save them, but he would always wait until the last possible moment to do so and it was apparent that he enjoyed the cleverness of the act, not the saving of human life. And it soon became a real worry for the Darling children that Peter would eventually grow bored and not dive down to collect them if they fell at all. Going back to Peter forgetting the Darling children and shooting off on his own adventures and returning back and forth, he would forget them as well, and sometimes would fly directly past them, only stopping because Wendy tried to remind him who they were. So along with the fear that Peter might not be around to catch them if they fell out of the air or would just grow bored and not bother trying, the Darling children were often left cold and hungry by themselves, only able to get food by snatching it out of birds' mouths. And because Peter had not taught them how to stop flying yet, they worried that if he abandoned them forever, they would just have to keep flying on and on and on. This next point is a small one, but nonetheless important, particularly when viewing Peter Pan as a tyrant. Now, while I personally am a fan of actions rather than words, I believe that you could say anything while doing something else, and I will judge you based on your actions more than your words, I do want to mention that Peter Pan only says he's sorry once in the entire story. This one instance of saying sorry happens to Tinkerbell, when she's been shut up in the drawer in the Darling's nursery, Peter realises this, releases her from the drawer, and she starts shouting at him. To which Peter does say that he is sorry, however, it seems to be more of a I'm sorry that you're upset than an actual apology. This next point is rather long because I have included a lot of examples, and it is that Peter Pan doesn't care. He doesn't care when he's being a cocky show-off. He doesn't care about the rules he sets for the Lost Boys and how they could cause harm or upset. He doesn't care that he upsets others. He doesn't care when Wendy is presumed dead, being more puzzled than pained and immediately wanting to hop off in a comical sort of way and never go near her body again. J.M. Barry himself describes Peter Pan as having a careless manner, the careless boy. Peter also decided to prove he didn't care after Wendy, John, Michael and all of the lost boys left the home under the ground. He sits playing gaily on his pipes and does not give them a sad word of farewell. And one very poignant line, I forget them after I kill them, Peter said carelessly. For the next point, I'd like to address Peter's rules, the rules that he has for the lost boys on the Neverland. The most important of which is that you cannot grow up. You cannot show signs of growing up. And if you do so, Peter will thin you out. It's never described exactly what he does, but seeing as we're looking at him as a tyrant right now, this could very well mean murder. 
The other rules Peter has are that the Lost Boys cannot look in the least bit like him, cannot know anything that he does not know, and there are forbidden subjects as well. They are not allowed to discuss their mothers in front of Peter, and they are also not allowed to talk about how Peter Pan has no weight to him whatsoever. Peter Pan has killed and will kill again. Really think about that for a moment. When seeing Peter Pan as a tyrant, he has killed many times. He doesn't care that he has killed many times, he sees it all as part of the game, and he has also disfigured a man. He chopped off Captain Hook's right hand, meaning that he has to have a iron hook instead of a hand now. If you want to see Peter Pan as a tyrant, bearing all that in mind, I can see why. Speaking of killing, when Peter and the Lost Boys all believe that Wendy Darling is dead, slain by the arrow Tootles fired at her, Peter immediately takes the arrow and is about to stab Tootles with it, as a sort of equal eye for an eye, one murder for another murder. They only stop because they realise that Wendy has survived. Something else to note is that to Peter Pan, make-believe and real are one and the same. He never sees a difference between the two. And this leads to some interesting tyrannical behaviour. Peter Pan can eat a make-believe meal and feel that he is full. The Lost Boys cannot. However, it is entirely up to Peter whether the meals they have are make-believe or real, and so sometimes the Lost Boys can go without food. Not quite murder right now, but going back to the sort of disfigurement thing, when you come to join Peter Pan and the Lost Boys while they are living in the home under the ground hideout, you are given a hollow tree. That is your entrance into and out of the home under the ground. However, you must fit your tree, not the other way around. And if, when Peter measures you for your tree, you do not fit, he does things to you to make you fit. In the play, J.M. Barry says that he does these things with a roller. I'm not sure whether this makes it more or less sinister, but either way, if you don't fit your tree, you have to be altered a little. And John Darling had to be altered a little in the story. The next point comes from right near the very end of the story as a small throwaway comment from when the Lost Boys, Peter, Wenny, John and Michael have taken over the pirate ship, the Jolly Roger, and are sailing it back to take the Lost Boys, Wenny, John and Michael home to London. Peter Pan, of course, becomes the new captain. And Captain Pan is described as using the cat and nine tails on his Lost Boys. I'm adding this in later because my camera just had a whole moment through a little tantrum and I lost a bunch of footage, so... Hi, welcome back to Peter Pan as a Tyrant. Here is the last thing that I was supposed to say on that. In the penultimate chapter of the novel, and right near the end of the stage play, Peter Pan flies on ahead of the Darling Children and the rest of the Lost Boys. They took over the Jolly Roger after the pirates had been dispatched, and they sailed it to the Azores, and then, because it saved time, they started to fly back to London. Peter and Tinkerbell flew on ahead of everybody else and rushed into the Darling's nursery where Peter Pan, from the inside, closed and barred the window, then meaning to escape by the front door, so that when the Darling children and the Lost Boys reached the window, they would believe that the Darling parents had barred them out and would return back with him to the Neverland. This can very easily be used to see Peter Pan as a complete tyrant, and I understand why. I would like to just mention that he does change his mind because he sees how sad Mrs. Darling is missing her children, and he realises that they can't both have them, but he still nonetheless tried to do it in the first place, so uh, yeah, make of that what you will. That is my last point for seeing Peter Pan as a tyrant though, so let's move on to Peter Pan as a true innocent. The first thing I want to mention is that Peter Pan is no longer a human. He is a betwixt and between, as described by the wise old Solomon. He is no longer human and not quite bird. J.M. Barry describes that Peter Pan stopped being a human when he was one week old. Therefore, it could be argued that holding this betwixt and between eternal entity of joy to the human standards of right and wrong, of morals and consequences and actions, might well not be relevant, seeing as he is no longer human at all. And now, once again, I would like to go back to Peter Pan forgets everyone and everything. To go along with the morality of this and seeing him as truly innocent of his actions and his crimes, can we really hold somebody accountable for an action they don't even remember taking? I'd also like to take a look once again at Peter's first unfairness on Maruna's Rock. 
J.M. Barry describes that every child is deeply affected by their first unfairness, and afterwards they will never quite be the same again. But of course, Peter has, J.M. Barry says, often met his first unfairness, but he forgets it over and over every time. And so, like a true, naive, innocent little child, he is just as horrified and shocked every time he meets it. And that's why it affects him so much. And also his constant forgetting leaves Peter Pan in a delightful yet vulnerable state. He will forever be excited by things that seem new to him, new delights, new adventures, new things that while he may have lived them or a version of them many, many times over and over again, and bear in mind by this point in the year 2023, Peter Pan may well have been alive for over 200 years, and so of course everything is always going to be new and exciting to him. But on the flip side of that, he will always be wounded and hurt by the things that he was not expecting. Things like being treated unfairly. If you had the memory of that first time, you might better know how to cope with it in the future. But of course, Peter doesn't. Like a true innocent then, Peter experiences everything for the first time over and over again. Again, I would like to come back to an earlier point and look at it from a different perspective. And this point is that Peter Pan does not know the difference between make-believe and real. And this could be used as an example of Peter's true innocence when you look at that scene on Maruna's rock. Even when facing death for, again, what he believes is the first time, Peter still manages to say, to die will be an awfully big adventure. While looking at Peter as a true innocent, in this key moment, you see that he views everything as make-believe and a game and an adventure. And in his innocence, he even puts that belief on death itself. One of the biggest and most obvious examples of seeing Peter Pan as a true innocent is in his complete lack of any adult emotions and feelings. He has no notion of sex, sexuality, sex drive, lust, that kind of thing. He does not know romantic love. The only relationships and bonds that he knows are friend, family, and foe. That was a bit of alliteration I wasn't quite intending to do there, but we'll move on from that. Peter does not understand what Wendy and Tiger Lily want to be to him. He doesn't understand why Tinkerbell is jealous of Wendy, and he doesn't understand why Wendy gets so frustrated when she asks Peter what he is to her, and he says, your devoted son. This will never change. He will never experience those adult concepts and ideas. And that is a perfect example of just how quite literally innocent Peter is. The last thing I want to say as a point for Peter Pan as a true innocent is Peter's hatred and fear of grown-ups. It is, as I've said many times before, very easy to see why Peter has such a hostile relationship with grown-ups. Starting with his own history, his own family barring the window shut on him. Even when he was first living in Kensington Gardens, he would experience children who had been lost by their parents, who then didn't come back for them or came back too late. Again, reinstating this belief that grown-ups are not to be relied on at all. When he went to the Neverland, grown-ups became a literal enemy. He would fight them, not just the pirates, but also Tiger Lily and her people, and many other inhabitants of the Neverland. It was a dangerous place, and many of the people there were grown-ups. You then have characters like Mrs. Darling, who tries to persuade Peter to come home and grow up despite his refusal. You have characters like Wendy Darling, who try to convince him to grow up and tell him that the way he's living is wrong. And then she herself grows up and the cycle continues. It's not hard to see why Peter does not trust grown-ups. And his absolute retreat from anything to do with the grown-up world is just another symbol of his true innocence. Time to wrap up this video and do some final thoughts then, but I want you guys to tell me, what do you see Peter Pan as? Do you see him as a tyrant? Do you see him as a tragedy? Do you see him as a true innocent? Or something else entirely? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. I am very interested to hear what you guys think. Some will see Peter Pan as a tragedy. A tragic figure of circumstance who is doomed to eternally repeat the same things over and over again in a forever of forgetting. Others will see Peter Pan as a tyrant, a villain who continues, while forgetting, to make the same decisions over and over again. He chooses murder. He chooses cruelty. He chooses to make the rules that he does. And then you have others who will see Peter as a true innocent, always living in the present with childlike wonder. 
forever forgetting for an eternity of first times and new experiences. But now, what do you think? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. What do you think of this fascinating character? I did not get to dive into him nearly as much as I would like to, but this video is already running long and I lost a bunch of footage and had to refilm. Thank you for sticking with me for this slightly belated Monday Madness. I do have a lot more Peter Pan content on my page if you want to go find my Neverland Watch playlist. If you haven't seen my Never Never Mini Movie project, go watch that. And I do have a lot of other content that is absolutely nothing to do with Peter Pan at all. I have cosplay content, I have behind the scenes making content, I have angsty Russian plus Livnia Spadania content. There is something for almost everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your week, my wonderful jelly spoons. Goodbye.